So I'm going to give you a talk today about epilepsy surgery and just give you some background about what uh, I think you may or may not already know. My name is Chantal Harazdal, by the way, and I'm a new member of the epilepsy team at Vancouver General Hospital. And I just completed my training in epilepsy in Calgary. And uh, I'm actually going to start off by showing you a little bit of the research that we were doing there because this gives a little bit of background um, to the talk and a little bit of my inspiration as to why I'm doing this talk. Um, certainly, my area of interest is in epilepsy surgery, and uh, I did a research paper just this past year where we looked at patient perceptions and barriers to epilepsy surgery, and we looked at a large health region in Calgary, and we surveyed about 100 patients in our epilepsy clinic, and we asked them some questions, basically trying to understand what do people with epilepsy know about epilepsy surgery in general? And uh, are they well informed about the availability of surgery and the potential benefits and risks of surgery? And so here's some of the data that we found. We found that while about 83% of our patients were aware that surgery can sometimes be an option for people with epilepsy, what they didn't know is that you can see here 50% of our patients didn't know if they themselves were candidates for epilepsy surgery. They knew it existed, but not if they were actually candidates or if they were felt to be somebody who could benefit from epilepsy surgery. We also asked people some questions about the risks of surgery, and overall people really tended to overestimate the risks of epilepsy surgery. When people asked how dangerous is epilepsy surgery in carefully selected patients, you'll see here that around 60% of people felt that surgery was very dangerous or moderately dangerous. And I'll give you some statistics throughout this talk, but generally in medicine, we don't feel that epilepsy surgery is qualified as something that's very or moderately dangerous, or we generally wouldn't be recommending it. Another question we ask people is, brain surgery should be considered as a last resort. Agree or disagree? And you can see here, again, around 60% of people somewhat agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. And I would argue that brain surgery should not be considered as a last resort for reason, reasons that I'll explain. We also ask people, in your opinion, which of the following are problems that are sometimes happening to people who have seizures? And you can see there are a lot of things that you could all likely identify with, not being able to drive, relationship difficulties, discrimination, problems concentrating and remembering, medication side effects, troubles doing well in school or holding a job. Status epilepticus, which is prolonged seizures or clustered seizures where you don't return to normal in between. Seizure-related injury, that's things like falls or pneumonia from aspiration if you don't protect your airway properly. One thing that people tended not to be aware of is this entity called SUDEP. Have any in the audience heard of SUDEP? So that's sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients. And this doesn't get talked about a lot of the time because it's a bit of a scary concept and we don't want to cause more anxiety in our patients. But I think it's important to emphasize that the more that you have seizures that aren't controlled on medications, then the more there is a risk of having this unfortunate unexpected death, which is something that we don't understand fully in medicine. But it is a risk to having epilepsy that's not controlled. And in medicine, we're basically balancing the scale, the risks of the seizures themselves and things like SUDEP with the risk of surgery. And so the balance often will favor surgery. And so I'll give you a little bit more information about SUDEP just in case you haven't heard of it. So sudden death in a person with epilepsy who is otherwise healthy and the death can't be explained by an accident from the seizure, for example, an injury or status epilepticus. This is still quite rare. You see one in every 500 to one in every 1,000 patients. But this is 24 times higher the risk of sudden unexpected death than it is in the general population. And the risk is highest in people who have uncontrolled seizures at nighttime. That's what nocturnal means. So here are some websites if you wanted to read more about what SUDEP is. Then to go back. In general, brain surgery for epilepsy or seizure disorders is more dangerous than having seizures that are not controlled. And this is where about 33% or one out of every three people that we asked that question 
either somewhat or strongly agreed with that statement. And that statement is actually false. So in general, brain surgery for your seizure disorder is less dangerous than having ongoing uncontrolled seizures. And this is why we often make a recommendation for brain surgery if we think that you're a good candidate. And then lastly, what I wanted to point out is that people have different treatment goals when they go into epilepsy surgery. And we asked people with regards to their seizure disorder what were important goals for them. And you can see that almost everyone wants to never have another seizure. And I think we're all on the same page there. Another very common goal that people have is that they want to be able to have better memory, concentration, be able to drive, be able to go back to work, stop medications. All these types of goals are commonly endorsed by people with epilepsy. But I think it's important to emphasize, I've put stars beside the goals that are most common, that some of these goals like coming off medicines and being able to have better memory and concentration may or may not be achieved with epilepsy surgery. And so this is where I'm going to give you the evidence so you understand what realistic expectations are for epilepsy surgery. Because it's actually uncommon for somebody to have epilepsy surgery and to be completely seizure free and to come completely off all medications and to have completely normal memory and concentration after. So you have to go into the surgery or the expect with the, the right expectations of that procedure. So that's a little bit of background about some of the information that I acquired when I was a fellow in epilepsy. And the take home message from that project was that we need to do a better job in medicine of educating people with epilepsy about surgery so that they can know if it's the right thing for them and how to advocate for themselves to get medical attention and consideration of surgical candidacy if it's appropriate. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, well, who is a good candidate for epilepsy surgery? I'm gonna show you some of the evidence behind epilepsy surgery and why we do it. And then we're gonna highlight different types of surgical options that are available for epilepsy control and the benefits and risks of those procedures. And then if we have time at the end, I've also got some slides looking at some of the new interventions that are being studied mostly in a research setting to help control seizures in people who otherwise aren't candidates for traditional epilepsy surgery. And usually the traditional epilepsy surgery, which I'm going to be talking about for the first part of the talk, is where we resect an area of the brain that is causing the seizures. So here's the brain. I think you've all seen pictures of the brain before. We divide the brain into four main lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And seizures can come from any of these lobes of the brain. The most common areas are the temporal lobe followed by the frontal lobe and less commonly the parietal and occipital lobes. But what we're doing when we're talking about epilepsy surgery is we're talking about potentially taking out an area of the brain that seems to be causing the seizures to see if we can stop the seizures from happening. So a few statistics. So the definition of epilepsy, you are all likely aware, but it's basically a predisposition to having recurrent seizures without a clear trigger. And epilepsy affects up to 1% of the world population. And that incidence, that means the number of people with epilepsy is increasing as our population ages. Focal epilepsy and focal seizures are more common than generalized seizures. And basically what this means is that the seizures are felt to start in one area of the brain and maybe then they spread and cause a generalized seizure. But usually there's one area of the brain that the seizure starts. And that's the area that may be hard to control with medications. And this is where epilepsy surgery may be helpful to take out that area of the brain where the seizures are starting. So there are studies that date back over almost 14 years now almost, looking at the effect of our medications for epilepsy. And certainly medicines are the first line of therapy in people who have seizures. And you'll see here that if you take 100 people who have a new diagnosis of epilepsy, about half of them, or around 50%, will respond to a first anti-epileptic medication. AED is anti-epileptic drug, or an anti-seizure medication. After that, if you don't respond to that first medicine, then there's another 13% of people who can benefit from trying a second drug, 
Thereafter, unfortunately, only about 4% of people will actually get a complete control of their seizures with adding a third or a fourth or a tenth drug. Now, when I say success, I'm very picky. When I say success, I mean no seizures, okay? So if you've already tried two medicines, it doesn't mean that other medicines aren't gonna help you, but it does mean that statistically, more medicines are unlikely to completely stop your seizures altogether. And that's where there's this big hunk of the pie, which is basically about a third of people with focal epilepsy, where the medicines alone are not likely to stop those seizures completely. And this is the population where it might be worth considering epilepsy surgery. So this group here in this sort of turquoise box is, is the group we call drug-resistant epilepsy. So our medical definition of that is that you have to fail adequate trials of two tolerated, appropriately chosen, used anti-epileptic drugs. You can use the drug either by itself or you can use the drugs together and it's a failure of those drugs to cause sustained freedom from seizures. That's how we define drug-resistant epilepsy. And it's people who have drug-resistant epilepsy who may benefit from epilepsy surgery. By the way, if you have questions as I'm going, just feel free to ask, okay? So what's an adequate medication trial? Well, this is where your doctor needs to pick the right drug at the right dose and you have to be on it for the right duration. You can't just give it a try for two days and say that it didn't work for you. You also have to have the right drug levels in your blood if the drug levels can be measured. And sometimes we don't have drug levels, but we wanna know that at least you're taking your medication as prescribed, because sometimes people don't take their medicines or forget to take their medicines, and then we can't blame the drug for not working. And we have to make sure that the drug isn't stopped just because of side effects. So if somebody takes a baby dose of a new seizure medicine and they don't go up to higher doses that are studied to be effective, then we can't say they failed that drug. But it's certainly reason to try a different drug that might have different side effect profile that might be better tolerated. But it doesn't mean that you failed that drug if you didn't try it at a good dose. Those statistics I showed you earlier with that pie chart were people who had a good dose for a good amount of time and weren't limited by side effects. So this is a little bit of background. Some of you may have heard of Wilder Penfield. He's a very famous neurosurgeon and he's Canadian and he is basically the pioneer of epilepsy surgery and he was from the Montreal Neurologic Institute. And he did his studies in the early 1900s. And these are, this is Dr. Penfield. And this is some of his drawings in uh, a medical journal, whereby he would show that he would do the craniotomy, remove the bone, see an area of abnormal brain that was causing seizures. And he would take that area out, and then the seizures would potentially be cured. And so now we're you know, almost not quite 80 years later, basically. And when do you go for epilepsy surgery nowadays? Well, basically, resective surgery is a consideration in patients with drug-resistant, uncontrolled, disabling focal epilepsy. So if the seizures come from a region on the brain that we can remove without having significant risk to your neurologic function, things like your ability to remember things or your ability to move the other side of your body, those are important functions. If we can take out that area of the brain without causing disabling neurologic deficits, then we consider epilepsy surgery. But we have to remember that your seizures they have to be disabling seizures for us to consider epilepsy surgery. So if you just get a funny smell once a year, I'm not gonna go and take you to the operating room to get rid of that because that's not disabling for you. But if you get a funny smell and then after that you don't remember what happened for a period of time and because of that you can't drive and you're having a hard time keeping a job, then we talk about epilepsy surgery. Now, what does it mean to have a surgical evaluation? 
So in almost all cases, there are at least three things that happen, and some of you may have gone through some of these tests in the past. There's continuous video EEG monitoring, there's an MRI of the brain, and then there's neuropsychology testing. And this is something we do in almost everybody before taking them to the operating room for epilepsy surgery. So we're gonna go through what each of those things are. So the seizure investigation unit in the adult hospital at Vancouver General Hospital is two beds that we have. We're trying to get funding from the government so we can offer more beds. The children's hospital here at the BC Children's also has a seizure monitoring unit. And the first goal of coming into the seizure monitoring unit is basically to analyze your spells. And it's important for your doctors to see what your events look like on video and to see if these are definitely seizures that we're even talking about or if it's some other type of spell. And if they are seizures, we want to know if they're associated with altered responsiveness, loss of memory, what do they look like. And so you come in and get an EEG hooked up and this is an example of a child where the uh, EEG is all bandaged up so that you're not likely to have the electrodes get pulled off. But in adults, we usually don't even do that. We just leave those electrodes on. And then you hang out and wait and watch TV and get bored. Yeah, bored is right. Yeah, exactly. So what, what the second goal of being in the seizure investigation unit is, is to localize those seizures. So once we capture them, we want to know where on the brain are they coming from. And so this is an example of a man sitting in a couch type lazy boy chair, which we don't have at BGH. Um, and the, <laughs> the seizures, the seizures uh, are then displayed on the EEG, which allows us to decide where on the brain we think the seizures are coming from. And in some people, the seizures come from only one area of the brain. So if you're lucky, that's the case. But sometimes seizures come from more than one area of the brain. Or sometimes this EEG doesn't give us a definite answer to that question of exactly where on the brain the seizures are coming from. Then we do an MRI. And so basically nowadays everybody gets an MRI as long as you don't have a contraindication to going into the MRI machine. And that would be something like having a pacemaker or metal in your body that would preclude you from going into the MRI. And the MRI allows us to look for structural abnormalities on the brain that might be a cause for seizures. And here's an example of the most common cause for focal seizures in adults, which is called mesiotemporal sclerosis. And this is an area of the brain. If you take the brain and you cut it from top to bottom, and I'm looking at this person's brain like they're looking out at you. So this is their right side and this is their left side. And this is the area of the temporal lobe that often causes seizures. And this is called the hippocampus. And you can see here there's some increase in this white signal. So that's some scarring of the hippocampus. And it's a little bit smaller and atrophic. We call it atrophic when there's less volume. So this is a common cause for epilepsy where we might be able to take out that hippocampus. Another kind of cause for epilepsy might be a tumor, for example. So here's an example of a tumor in the temporal lobe. And we look at this at different sequences and different slices of the brain to try and understand what type of tumor this might be. Or maybe it's not a tumor, maybe it's an abnormal collection of blood vessels, or maybe there's been an old head injury with some bleeding and scarring. And we use this to try and help decide if that looks like it might be where the seizures are originating from. And we put that together with the information on the EEG to decide if it's an area of the brain that looks like we could resect. But the big question, like we talked about at the beginning, is that balance. Can we take out that area of the brain without too many side effects or problems? And this is where the neuropsychology testing helps. Oops, oh, before I get to that, I wanted to point out that your MRI brain may be normal. And in about half of patients, it is a normal MRI brain, okay? And we don't have a clear structural abnormality that we can take out. That doesn't mean that you can't still have epilepsy surgery. It just means that it's a little bit harder for us and it's a little bit more complicated. But it's not a contraindication to still being considered for epilepsy surgery if you have a normal MRI of the brain. And I'll show you some other techniques we can use later that help us to look for where the seizures might be coming from, even if you have a normal structural MRI. 
Just because the structure looks normal, it doesn't mean that the function is normal. And underlying, there's somewhere in that brain that is having abnormal electrical activity and causing seizures, even if we can't see it. With our current technology, you give it another 10 years and we'll potentially be able to see it better. And already nowadays, our MRIs are much better than they were in the past. So I sometimes have people come to my clinic, they say, oh, my MRI was normal. And I said, well, when did you have your MRI? Oh, 1998. And I said, well, let's repeat that. And then sure enough, we might find something because our technology is better. So going back to the function of the brain now is neuropsychology testing. So this is where you have testing done by a neuropsychologist who sits down in a room with you and spends about a half a day, twice, or a whole day, depending on the center you're at, and basically does different paper and pencil tests to try and test things like your memory and your language and this sort of thing. And basically, this gives us an idea of how your brain is functioning and if there's an area of the brain that may not be functioning quite as well as normal. And sometimes that's something you don't know about until you get this detailed testing done. So what other tests can be done before epilepsy surgery? So those are the main ones, okay? Those three tests are the meat and potatoes of a surgical workup. There's the monitoring in the SIU, there's the MRI, and then there's the neuropsychology testing. But there are other tests that are sometimes done depending on the person. And this can include things like a psychiatry consultation, a WADA test, which is a language test, a language fMRI. I'm going to explain all of these things in the next slide. Some nuclear medicine studies or intracranial monitoring, which is monitoring for the seizures right inside the skull, right on top of the brain. So we'll talk about these, but keep in mind that this won't necessarily be for everybody. It depends on the case. So people with epilepsy often, almost, almost always, I'm not going to say always, but almost always have associated problems with anxiety, mood, because epilepsy is not a fun condition to have. And it's something that is very challenging to deal with. Uh, because there's a lot of disability and limitations that come with epilepsy. So we find in our patients, especially people who are being considered for epilepsy surgery, that it's often helpful to have a mental health assessment with a psychiatrist to help optimize mental health things like anxiety, depression. And it may be that some counseling would help. It may be that some medications are needed. Um, and uh, unfortunately, with epilepsy surgery, there's always going to be a small risk that the surgery itself can lead to a lot of improvement that I'm going to show you. But there's always a small risk that people who have problems with mental health can have those problems worsen after epilepsy surgery. So that's why we like to make sure that we've addressed that and we haven't ignored it before people go into surgery. So we can optimize the chances that everything goes well with the surgery and with coping with the surgery and the stresses of the surgery itself. Another test we do is called a WADA test. Now this is not done very often. WADA, Dr. WADA is actually a, a physician who trained and started up our program here in Vancouver. So he is uh, the Dr. Wada is our very own here in Vancouver, and he designed this test to help look at what side of the brain is important for language function and memory function. So what he does with this test, and we still do this test at Vancouver General Hospital, is that this is the brain looking out at you. So this is the right side of the brain and the left side, and these are the blood vessels, the arteries going up to the brain. And what happens is that the neuroradiologist puts a catheter into the artery and shoots up a dye that we would normally do to look at the blood vessels of the brain. And then what we do is we actually give an anesthetic, uh, something called sodium amobarbital. So basically, this is a medicine that puts your brain to sleep. So it puts half your brain to sleep. And you're still awake because the other side of the brain works normally. And what this allows us to do is to predict what would happen if we were to take out this green part of anything on the green side of the brain. So, for example, most people who are right-handed have their language sit in their left hemisphere. So if I was to inject your left hemisphere with this anesthetic, 
then usually what would happen is that you would stop talking. And so here's the doctor testing the patient and is asking the patient to name different objects. And with this left-sided injection, the patient's not going to be able to talk and is going to stutter if, if anything is said. And the other thing we can do is test the memory. So you get pictures that you're asked to name. And even if you can't name them, you're asked to remember what you've seen. And then when the dye wears off and once the an, an, uh, sorry, anesthetic wears off, it only lasts for three to five minutes. Then we test your memory and see what you remember. And then we do the same thing on the other side of the brain after a period of five minutes. So this allows us to see which area of the brain is most important for your language. And most people, it's the left side if you're right-handed. So we usually don't have to do this test, but sometimes we do if there's inconsistencies with the other testing that we have. We probably only do a handful of these a year at Vancouver General Hospital. What this is being replaced by in some centers is language fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. This looks at the amount of blood flow to areas of the brain when they're used. And so you can compare the blood flow during a rest activity, doing nothing, compared to a function activity like naming or speaking. And then the area of the brain that has the change in that blood flow in the change in the oxygen signal will light up. So here's an example of somebody who's had an area of the brain that's abnormal. And what we've done is given them a task to test their language, and it lights up where their language sits. So it tells the surgeon, you're not OK to go take this area out. But you can probably take out this area around here. A cerebral PET scan is, this stands for uh, positron emission tomography. And this is a nuclear medicine study where we do this study in between seizures and we give a dye that labels glucose. And then the dye goes to different areas of the brain and we're looking to see where the metabolism, where the body, the, the cells of the brain take up that glucose. We look to see where that is decreased. And you can see here, this is that section of the brain I showed you before from top to bottom and the person's looking out at you. And remember, I showed you those hippocampi, or common area where seizures come from. So here's an area where there's normal metabolism. And the area where the seizures come from often has a decrease in metabolism. So there's less of that nuclear medicine contrast lighting up there. So that points to an area of abnormal function in the brain, even if that MRI didn't show us an actual structural change there. So that might help us to localize where the seizures are coming from. Another test we can do is a different nuclear medicine study called a SPECT scan. That's single photon emission, emission commute, computed tomography, but we just call it SPECT. And basically what we do here is that, again, there's a labeled radioactive tracer that gets injected into the blood and this allows us to measure blood flow to an area of the brain. And when we look between seizures, the area that the seizure is coming from will tend to have lower blood flow. Just like I showed you, it had lower metabolism of glucose before, lower sugar metabolism. But during a seizure, what we can do in some centers is inject this dye at the very beginning of a seizure when you're in the seizure monitoring unit. We try to capture the seizure and we inject the dye as quick as we can. And then we look to see where there's more blood flow because usually during a seizure, there's more blood flow in that area. So here's an example of a scan where the patient has more blood flow during a seizure, less blood flow between seizures, and then the computer subtracts those two scans, does some fancy analysis, lights up where the seizure looks like it's coming from, and then superimposes that on our MRI that we took. So there's a lot of really fancy stuff out there that exists, but it does take a lot of subspecialty expertise and neuroradiologists and nuclear medicine specialists and technology that's capable of doing this type of analysis. We did do this analysis in Calgary where I trained in the adult population. 
And in the children's population, they have the resources to do that here in Vancouver. But right now, we're still working to be able to do this study in our adult population in Vancouver. So some more questions you probably have. What if it is still unclear where the seizures are coming from after all of that stuff I just showed you? Are you still a candidate for epilepsy surgery? And this is where you might need to go to intracranial monitoring. And this is about one out of every five patients who come in for epilepsy surgery. And intracranial monitoring means that we record right on top of the brain. Because when we do that skull monitoring that I showed you at the beginning, we're outside of the bone. And there's a lot of artifact that can happen between the brain and the hair. So what we do is we actually do one of two me methods to record right on top of the brain. We can put grids or strips, which I'll show you, right on top of the brain. The surgeon takes off the skull and puts these right on top of the brain, then puts the skull back on top and we record the seizures again in the seizure investigation unit. Or there are what are called depth electrodes. And yes, this looks incredibly scary because it looks like some kind of shish kebab meat skewers going right through the brain. But believe it or not, your brain can tolerate this. So there are very small, small, thin little wires that go through right into the brain. And they can record all along their length. There's little electrodes that are recording. And so sometimes these help us to record where seizures are coming from, particularly in areas that aren't right at the surface of the brain, but are, that are deeper inside the brain, that are hard to access otherwise. And so here are some pictures of what those electrodes look like. So if you go for intracranial monitoring here in Vancouver, our adult patients generally go for this monitoring uh, type one under the dura of the brain. The dura is the lining that is over top of the brain. So these get slipped under the dura on top of the brain, either a big grid or little strips. And there's different sizes and permutations and combinations that can get placed over the brain in different areas depending on where we think your seizures are coming from. And here's an example of a little strip that might get placed. Or if you go for depth electrode monitoring, you can see this is what they look like. So they just look like these thin little wires and the surgeon is able to place those through tiny little screw holes that are made in the skull. And then those get fed in to the brain to record over different areas that are, again, selected in advance. So <coughs> this is an example of what subdural electrode placement would look like. So this is somebody's skull removed. And I'm sorry if you don't like to see this, so I'll move on quickly enough. But it just gives you an idea of what we're looking at. We're putting a grid on top and different numbers. And we're recording over those numbers to see where the seizures look like they're coming from. Another uh, thing that we do, of course, or this is just a picture to show you, for example, what it looks like uh, on our screen when we're recording the seizures. We're trying to find where the buzzing activity is starting, and that's the abnormal electrical activity. The other type is where these electrodes get put in as deep sort of needle-like things, and that's an example of what that would record like. This picture is not actually the size. That's just the artifact on the MRI machine. That's not the size of these wires. They're very small. OK, no more pictures that are gross, so you can look now. Sorry, maybe I shouldn't have put those in. But I thought some people might want to know what it looks like. That's what, that's what we do. Um, so then, of course, you want to see the neurosurgeon. You don't want to just see me, because you want somebody who knows what they're doing when it comes to taking out the brain. And so you see the neurosurgeon after we've done all that other stuff, and we've decided if we think that you're a good candidate for epilepsy surgery. And usually we have conferences with the epilepsy specialists, neuropsychologists, maybe the psychiatrists, and then the neurosurgeons where we review the cases. And then you get referred to see the neurosurgeon. So what is the evidence behind all of this surgery I'm talking about? Have we come anywhere from those pictures I showed you from Dr. Penfield in 1930? So 
This is just to prove my point that we have over 350 surgical theories about epilepsy surgery specifically. And there are a number of studies that have been pooled together to give some statistics that I'm going to show you. But I think what I do want to emphasize is that we have only two class one, that's the best superb quality evidence, uh, research studies for epilepsy surgery. And they are both um, studies of temporal lobe epilepsy. So this is the first trial that came out in the year 2001. And uh, this was published by Sam Weeb, who is uh, the mentor who trained me in Calgary. And uh, he is an expert in epilepsy surgery worldwide. And he did this trial where basically what he did was he took people who had temporal lobe seizures after that workup I showed you, and he randomized them to either get epilepsy surgery right away, or they had to go on the wait list like everybody else, and they had to wait at least a year. And then he compared the seizure freedom in the people who had surgery right away to the seizure freedom in people who had to wait a year for surgery. And that trial showed that surgery is much better than prolonged medical therapy for people who have medically refractory temporal lobe epilepsy. And so this was the group he took. He took adults who had temporal lobe seizures for at least a year. They had to have seizures at least monthly to be included in the trial, and they had to have failed at least two anti-seizure drugs. And then these were some other things that he excluded from the trial just to make it a nice, clean group. And so 80 patients were randomized to surgery within a year versus surgery within four weeks. And the surgical workup was exactly what we talked about, that scalp video EEG, MRI, neuropsychology testing, and they may or may not have had that language test with that an, uh, anesthetic injection. And so this is the surgery that that research trial uh, entailed. It was what's called an anterior temporal resection. So depending on which side of your brain that was, if it was your language dominant side, your left side, or if it was your non-language dominant, your right side, a little bit more is taken if it's your right side of the brain than your left. And this whole block of temporal lobe gets resected. Whether or not you have an abnormal picture of the brain, this is based on the seizures coming from the temporal lobe based on what your doctor sees on the video and what the EEG shows. And so you can see that the number needed to treat in this trial was two. So this is the, peop this is the percentage without seizures that impair awareness. So some people in this group may still have an occasional aura, but they always retain awareness. So you see this percentage of people is much higher in the surgical group than it is in the group that continues on medical therapy. So there's 40 people in each group. And you see here 8% of people who just stayed on medicines were seizure-free at one year, whereas 58% of people with surgery were seizure-free at one year. So that means that it takes two, for every two people that you treat with, with the epilepsy surgery, you're going to have one person who's completely seizure-free at one year. Okay? And that's if you use... Um, Sorry, completely seizure-free from disabling seizures, I'm sorry. That's the seizures where you lose awareness. Some people in here might still get a little aura, but that usually isn't disabling. The number needed to treat is three if you want to get rid of all seizures, even aura. That means that out of every three people who go for epilepsy surgery for a temporal type of seizure, that one person will be completely seizure-free at one year. So these numbers, you can look at the glass half empty or half full, but they're actually pretty darn good, okay, uh, given a lot of things in medicine. Uh, a lot of times we're doing numbers needed to treat of 100 or 1,000 if we're talking about giving you aspirin to prevent another stroke or something like that. So this number to, needed to treat of two is a very impressive number. That's a lot of people's lives you can change by offering epilepsy surgery. A subsequent research trial has come out just last year looking at early surgical therapy for drug-resistant temporal lobe epilepsy. Again, Dr. Weeb is part of this group. And this trial just confirmed again. By the way, what I, what I didn't explain was what I meant by class 1 evidence. That basically means that people are blinded. They don't know 
the out, when people do the outcome assessments for people with surgery, they don't know whether someone had surgery or not. And we, we compare the groups and make sure that everything else is controlled for, so there aren't other differences between the groups. This is the only other trial that did that in a randomized fashion. And you'll see in this trial, the numbers are a lot smaller, but basically 100% of people in the medical group were still having seizures at two years with temporal lobe epilepsy, whereas only 23% were having seizures at two years if they had surgery. And those who did have surgery had fewer seizures in general. So this just emphasizes that we now have two very good quality studies showing a role for epilepsy surgery in temporal lobe epilepsy. Yeah. Of course, very good question. So you're, you're just forecasting slides to come, so I'll show you about that, okay? Look at, I planted that question from you. <laughs> but go ahead, yeah. So children can be considered for surgery at any age. Even infants can sometimes go for epilepsy surgery. Usually, uh, when a child has failed two medicines, then the same discussion happens. These trials are in adults. But there are studies in children as well. And generally speaking, it depends on a lot of complexities because sometimes children have epilepsies that they outgrow, and that's not the kind of epilepsy that we would put under a surgery. But there are types of epilepsies often in childhood that children don't outgrow, and that's where, as epilepsy specialists, we have certain types of clinical pictures that we put people into. And if you fit a clinical picture that's concerning for ongoing seizures, lifelong, then surgery is considered in children as well. Okay, so now for the surgical complications. So firstly, if you have intracranial monitoring, that's just putting the grid over top of the brain or putting these depth electrodes in. The minor or temporary complication rate from that is around 5%. And that could be something like perhaps a small little area of bleeding that resolves and doesn't cause any permanent neurologic damage. It could be some sort of a minor infection at the site of the procedure, but it doesn't lead to a permanent damage, and that, that rate is based on a pooling of all studies from all centers. So any individual surgeon or center may give you their own local statistics, but that's the general rate of complication with intracranial monitoring. The major or permanent complication rate with intracranial monitoring is around a half a percent. So that could mean something like a stroke. For example, a blood vessel gets damaged and there's an area of the brain that dies and that may lead to a permanent deficit. That's a very small percentage when you look at the risks of ongoing seizures. The surgical risks for an actual resective surgery are of course higher than just the monitoring, but they're still quite low numbers all in all. So the risk of a medical complication that could be something like a pneumonia or a blood clot in the leg or some sort of a non-brain complication. It's around 5% for minor complications and 1% for major complications. So a major complication might be a heart attack around the time of the surgery or something like that, for example. So these numbers are actually quite low, all things considered. Neurologic complications are a little bit higher, as you'd expect. Around 10% of people will have minor complications, and around 5% will have major complications. And you might say, well, what the heck is major versus minor? And that is going to vary a bit from person to person in terms of how they define major and minor. But minor is an example of something that you go on and live with and life goes on. So for example, a minor complication for neurologic complication with temporal lobe epilepsy might be that your memory is not quite as good as it was before the surgery. But you're still able to remember day-to-day -day stuff and get around, but you may not be that 
top of the pack when it comes to remembering stuff you used to be able to remember. That's an example of where there's a trade-off, the memory versus the seizure control. A major complication would be something like this 1.5% risk of hemiparesis. So that would be the worst case scenario that everyone fears is some sort of a major stroke where half the body is weak, for example. And that's very, very rare. But one or one and a half people, or you can look at it like uh, about three people out of every 200 people that get this procedure will have that potential complication. But if you look at those numbers for sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients and you actually look at the risk of dying, not to be melodramatic, but dying from ongoing uncontrolled seizures and you add up those risks annually over a person's lifetime, these risks are actually quite low in, in comparison. They're acceptable. They're not perfect, but they're acceptable. And the risk of death around the surgery is at about 0.4%. And that's taking everybody. You have to remember, these risks are taking absolutely everybody who has a resective surgery. Your surgeon, if you're considered for surgery, will give you more specific statistics for your particular type of surgery that you're having. The risk of uh, permanent hemiparesis is much higher if the surgeon's operating right next to the area of the brain that controls your motor function than if the surgeon's operating over in your temporal lobe where there's no motor function at all. Okay, so that all depends on where the operation is happening. So what about... So vision loss is something that is common with temporal lobe seizures, and it's usually a more minor type of vision loss. It's very rarely the very central or middle part of your vision that's lost. Usually what we're talking about with temporal lobe surgeries are some radiations that go over to the back occipital part of the brain here, which normally is involved in vision. And those radiations, if they get dinged by the procedure, are usually associated with a little bit of loss of your visual field in the upper, outer part of your vision. And so usually people don't actually notice that on a day-to-day -day basis, but where it could be of relevance is if you want to get your driver's license back, sometimes that visual field cut can make it so driving is not safe. Usually, though, that visual field defect is asymptomatic or not clinically all that important. But that is a good question. That is something that we often see when we do the detailed testing of the visual fields after temporal lobe surgery. If you have a surgery of your occipital lobe where the vision sits, then your risk of losing vision is very high. And in rare cases, depending on what the disability is from the epilepsy, we may still do a resection of the occipital lobe knowing that there can be some visual loss. But it would be a trade-off, seizure control versus some of the vision. We would rarely take the whole vision area. And what would happen in the worst case scenario is that half of the vision would be gone, but you'd still see the other half of your visual world. We would very rarely do that. Yes, so you can have a deficit after epilepsy surgery that recovers over time, most definitely. Um, that all depends on the magnitude of the deficit. That means how big the deficit was to begin with. And it also depends on your age. So if you're a five-year-old and you go for a brain surgery, I'll show you some of the surgeries we can do in children, and it's quite amazing, actually. We can basically take out half the brain, and the other half can learn to compensate over time. But as you become older, your brain becomes less pliable that way, and there's less reserve to be able to compensate. But that said, a lot of people go for epilepsy surgery, and maybe after the surgery, wake up and your hand's not quite as quick as it used to be. And then over time, with physiotherapy and occupational therapy, that can get better. So there's certainly some reserve there. But for example, if you uh, had some sort of a major complication here and you woke up and your hand was completely weak, 
and you couldn't do anything, I wouldn't expect that to recover completely. Um, there's only so much reserve, but certainly there is room for improvement after surgery, and a lot of people do say that there might be some minor problem that they either improve on or learn to get used to. So what about epilepsy that's outside the temporal lobe? So I've talked about this temporal lobe epilepsy because that's the most common type. But you can have an abnormality anywhere else in the brain, and here are some examples. This is an abnormal collection of blood vessels that's causing seizures. This is a, an abnormal, uh, what we call cortical dysplasia, where the neurons that are in this outside lining of the brain didn't uh, migrate there and develop there properly when the baby was developing and they can be a cause for seizures. So those are examples of other things that might be something that we could target for surgery. And so seizure outcomes after surgery depend on where the seizures come from. And the big number to remember is about 40 to 50% when we take all these meta-analyses, so that's combining all the trials and pooling the numbers. And based on different studies here, you'll see people with temporal lobe epilepsy have a higher chance of seizure freedom. People who have extra temporal outside the temporal lobe have about 40 to 50% chance of seizure freedom with surgery. But this is, again, pooling everybody. Your statistics and numbers might be different depending on your specific case. So what if the MRI is normal? We talked about that. Sometimes the MRI is normal. And if you have a surgical workup with all those other tests I showed you that help your doctors decide where your seizures are coming from, you can also have up to about a 45% seizure freedom rate with epilepsy surgery, even if your MRI is normal. But statistically, your chance of being seizure-free with a normal MRI brain is lower than if you have a lesion, an abnormal MRI brain that the surgeon can target. So what should you expect after the surgery if you do go for epilepsy surgery? So the hospitalization for epilepsy surgery is usually about a week or under a week. Recovery usually takes a few weeks, however, and you may be advised to take a few months off of work to recuperate at home. Most people resume their usual activities after two to three months. This will depend on what type of surgery you're having. And then you'll see your epilepsy specialist and your surgeon in follow-up thereafter. So what happens with the medication use after surgery? So anti-epileptic drug outcomes after epilepsy surgery have been studied. And unfortunately, the longer you follow people, there's always going to be somebody whose seizures do come back the longer you follow people. So this is data following people over five years. And you'll see monotherapy means one drug. Polytherapy means more than one drug. And this blue is the everybody's dream and hope, seizure-free and anti-epileptic-free, so no drugs. And if you follow these people, these original numbers are the data after one year of follow-up. But then after five years of follow-up, you see the numbers are a little bit lower. So that basically about 85% of people still do need to stay on an anti-seizure medicine, at least one. And so this is where you have to have good and realistic expectations going into the surgery, that the surgery is unlikely to have you come completely off all seizure medications. That does happen for some people. That's about 15% of people. But it's not the majority, okay? And so what we do aim for is to minimize the, the number of meds or the dose of your meds so that you're not having as many side effects if you're having side effects from the medicine. And if somebody's on three medicines, it's very common that we then, after a period of one to two years, we then maybe bring down one of those medicines to just two medicines, and depending on how things are going, we might go down to one medicine. And it depends on different specialists' philosophies, different patients' philosophies, and how you're tolerating your medicines, whether you ever try coming completely off the medicine or not. So what are other outcomes that are affected by surgery? We talked about seizure freedom, we talked about medications, but as you can imagine, there are all other types of measures of quality of life and improvements in one's life that we have tried to look at in research. 
So neuropsychological studies have looked at memory in particular, and that's looking at the people who have temporal lobe seizures. And most do not have a significant decline in memory or thinking after epilepsy surgery. The risk of a decline is usually greater if it's in your language dominant hemisphere, your left hemisphere in most people. And that's why we sometimes do that WADA test to help decide about your risk for decline in memory. Social outcomes like full-time work, being able to drive, having improved lifestyle and relationships, independence, uh, being able to pursue education, financial uh, situations often do improve after epilepsy surgery. But we actually don't have the big numbers that we need to prove statistical significance for some of this compared to what I showed you for the seizure freedom rates. Overall, psychiatric outcomes are improved or there's no change. So that's things like mood and anxiety and problems with mental health. There are, however, some people who have that as a change after surgery that actually may deteriorate. But if you take everybody in total, usually things improve or stay the same, especially if we've done our due diligence with a psychiatry consultation and had your counseling and medications considered as deemed appropriate. And then quality of life in general improves in about 90% of patients who have epilepsy surgery. So that's a very high and promising number to keep in mind. And quality of life is a complex measure that takes into account all sorts of different elements of a person's day-to-day -day function. And we measure that by questionnaires, usually, that people fill out. So um, time dependent here, I thought I would just show you some of the other surgical options that are out there besides a resective surgery. So we talked about a resection uh, as the main type of epilepsy surgery we do. But there are other epilepsy surgeries that we call palliative. That means that the goal is not cure or complete seizure freedom, but the goal is an improvement in the number of seizures or in the amount of disability that people have because of their seizures. And so there are four different types of procedures that we can do, and I'm just gonna give you a slide about each of these. So vagal nerve stimulation is probably the next most common type of intervention that you may have heard of. We don't understand how this works, to be honest. You'll read books about it, but we don't really get it. But suffice it to say that somehow what happens is that we put this little wire into the chest wall. It's attached to a battery and a device, a little computer. And it's sort of like a pacemaker. That's what it looks like. It's under the skin. And then the wire, the nerve surgeon or the vascular surgeon feeds that wire around a nerve that runs down from the brain down into the, the chest. And that's called the vagus nerve. And so this little wire sets off little discharges intermittently, and we can set this at different settings. And what this can do is it can decrease the duration of a seizure, or it can decrease the frequency of seizures in people who have medically refractory epilepsy, and they're not felt to be good candidates for the resective surgery. So for example, if the seizures are coming from the area of the brain where you need that area to be able to move your right side of your body, then we might consider this procedure. But unfortunately, this only offers about a 50% reduction in seizures in 50% of people, okay? It's very seldom that this procedure stops seizures altogether. But what it can do is it can help, for example, if somebody is having frequent clusters of seizures, you can actually set this little device to go off with a magnet that's handheld. And so sometimes somebody will have a caregiver with them or they will have their own magnet on them and they can feel an aura or they know they just had a seizure and then they bring their magnet up to their device and they can actually stimulate that electrical activity and people do sometimes find that actually stops their seizure from happening again or they feel their seizure is shorter. So sometimes this is an option for people with epilepsy. It is, sorry? Interesting. Yeah, it's done mostly in the children in Vancouver, but we do have uh, adults who go for this procedure once in a while. 
A corpus callosotomy is where the surgeon actually goes in and cuts this connection called the corpus callosum that connects the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain. And this is usually done in people who have very disabling epilepsy where they're having big grand mal seizures, big generalized convulsions, falls and hits to the head that are happening many, many times, uh, sometimes daily and that they're not responding to medicines. By doing this, the surgeon may cut the anterior, that's the front two thirds of the corpus callosum and they may leave the back part or they may cut the whole part, the whole corpus callosum. And that can often stop those drop attacks and generalized seizures from happening. But that is something we rarely do in an adult who's otherwise quite high functioning because that can have a lot of adverse consequences as I'm sure you can imagine. Another thing that's very rarely done is what's called multiple subpeal transection. And basically, this is for areas where the seizure is coming from an important area that we can't take out. But instead of taking it out, the surgeon might go under and just cut the connections that cause the seizure to spread. But they're not important connections to still maintain that neurologic function that you need. This is not very effective though, and I have yet to see a case where this has helped someone dramatically, but it is something that is sometimes used to see if it offers benefit. A hemispherectomy is where there's a disconnection of one side of the brain, and this is rarely done, usually in children who have large abnormalities of the brain. Um, these are some of the examples of syndromes where one whole hemisphere may be abnormal and causing seizures, so the surgeon may be able to make these cuts that are shown to disconnect one hemisphere. And in the olden days, they would actually take that whole hemisphere out, but now they find that there's less complications if they just make the, the cuts to the connections of the brain. And in kids, this can actually, you would think that in an adult, that would lead you to be hemiplegic and half your body wouldn't be able to work normally. But in children, they can often compensate. And especially if people have a very abnormal brain here to begin with, oftentimes the other side of the brain has already taken up some of the function for the sick side of the brain so that this procedure may be tolerated. So are there any things that are up and coming? So there are five things that are up and coming. None of them are ready for prime time, but you may have heard about them. And we'll go through one slide for each of these. So hippocampal stimulation. So basically what this is, is that if you think of those depth electrodes I showed you at the beginning where we do intracranial monitoring, those long sort of wires, Sometimes those can be put into the hippocampi, which is the area that I've shown with the arrows. And then this is in people who maybe have seizures coming from both sides. And we can't take out both sides or else you would lose all your memory. So what we do is sometimes consider this procedure and there is actual electrical activity that contraintuitively may stop the seizures, even though you know seizures are abnormal electrical activity, but by providing the electrical activity, we can actually settle the brain down sometimes. So this data hasn't been all that promising. Uh, Sam Weeb, the uh, gentleman I told you about who spearheaded those other two randomized controlled trials, tried to run a trial of this, and I saw some patients with this when I trained, but ultimately the numbers are very small in recruiting and the, unfortunately the original data isn't very promising and so right now that trial is no longer happening in Canada. There is a trial that's been completed where the same idea happens except instead of stimulating the hippocampi, there's an area of the brain called the thalamus and it's in this area of the brain here that these electrodes get put and there's stimulation and this was used in people with refractory epilepsy in a study in 2010. And it showed about 50% reduction of seizures in 50% of patients, or 50% reduction of seizures overall when you took the whole group. While about 14% of people were seizure-free for the first six months, as time goes on, that rate drops. 
And just like the vagal nerve stimulator, we don't know exactly why this works for some people. So right now, this has not been approved by the uh, Food and Drug Association, the FDA uh, in the United States, because these numbers are not really much different than the numbers I showed you for the vagal nerve stimulation. And this is a higher risk procedure than vagal nerve stimulation. So right now, there are some trials ongoing to see what group of people might benefit from this specifically. What I think is the most exciting is what's called responsive neurostimulation. And what this does is it actually has a little computer that detects when a seizure happens based on these little electrodes that are implanted into the brain by the surgeon in the area that we think the seizures are coming from, but we can't resect because it's an important area. And this little computer will get that information, it will know a seizure is happening, and then it will start to discharge to try and stop the seizure from happening. And so this is still being investigated, but it has showed some initial preliminary data that is very promising. Radio surgery or gamma knife surgery is sometimes used for areas of the brain that are hard to access with surgery. And basically what this does is that it uh, aims a beam of radiation, just like somebody who has cancer has radiation therapy, and this beam of radiation goes to the area of the brain that isn't safe for the surgeon to take out. This is very seldom used, um, but there are certain types of tumors in certain areas of the brain, for example, that we may use this, because to get to the tumor otherwise, the surgeon would have to sacrifice other important tissue. But if it's an area of the brain that's accessible and we feel that the surgeon can't take it out without causing a neurologic deficit, then the neurologic deficit is going to happen with the radiation therapy to that area as well. So generally, that's not an option. And then the last thing that's the newest kit on the block is MRI-guided laser ablation therapy. But I'm going to tell you no more than that because basically it's similar to what I described with the radiation therapy, that it's an alternate to a resection. But still, if it's an important area of the brain that's causing the seizures, it can't be ablated with a laser, it can't be ablated with radiation, for example, or a knife. Anything that takes out that important area um, is where, unfortunately, surgery may not be helpful. And so just to end off, I wanted to point out what is the optimal timing of epilepsy surgery. And this sort of stems from that question I got asked about in children. Should children have epilepsy surgery? And the big message is that the sooner the better. And our Canadian statistics are a bit disheartening. Basically, the delays in undergoing epilepsy surgery average 10 years in children and 20 years of epilepsy in adults. And this is despite that randomized controlled trial I showed you that dates back almost 14 years now. This is very old data, but it's the best I've got just to give you an idea of how bad a problem this is. So, between the year 1998 and 1999, uh, in Canada, there were only 352 epilepsy surgeries, but there were 20,000 potential surgical candidates for epilepsy surgery. And so part of the problem here is that despite this evidence being out there, a lot of people don't know about it. A lot of patients don't know about it, don't ask their doctors about it. A lot of general practitioners or even some general neurologists don't necessarily advocate for epilepsy surgery as quickly as they should. And as a consequence of that, we also have limitations currently in the amount of resources that we have to put towards epilepsy surgery in terms of government funding for things like a seizure investigation unit and epilepsy surgeon and epilepsy specialists and this sort of thing. So this is something that uh, is uh, my plug to you to write your letters to your MLAs because I've written mine, but uh, the more people write and the more people voice that they would like to see changes here, then that's the only way we're going to bring about change. But I hope that at least by doing this talk and it'll be on the website, you can look at it or share it with your friends and other uh, patients you may know who have epilepsy, 
um, that the word will spread. And please ask your family doctors, your general neurologists, or your epilepsy specialists if this is something for you. And if it's not, then it's still helpful to advocate for your uh, peers and your co-patients who have this condition. So just to summarize, my conclusions are that surgery may offer freedom from disabling seizures in people who have failed medications. Various tests are used to help tailor the benefits and risks of surgery on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's the role of your specialists to balance the risks associated with a surgery on the brain with the risks of ongoing poorly controlled epilepsy. And epilepsy surgery should not be considered as a last resort. Ask your doctor about it. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any other questions. This is where Well, this is where um, I've tried to summarize a very complex topic in an hour and 15 minutes for you. Mm -hmm. And individual cases will have individual reasons why doctors may or may not have chosen not to go to surgery sooner. Sometimes it's that, unfortunately, it didn't get thought of or the resources weren't there. But I think a lot of the time, um, if if your child has already been followed here at the Children's Hospital and has been followed by experts in seizures, then it's very probable that there are good reasons why those experts didn't want to go to surgery in that particular context, because I don't know the details of your child's case. But, but generally speaking, um, if epilepsy surgery is felt to be something that a child would benefit from, usually the doctors nowadays are thinking of that sooner than later if it's an appropriate context and if it's a doctor who specializes in epilepsy and seizures. So unfortunately, a lot of people in the periphery or people who don't have um, subspecialty medical care may go for years or decades, as I showed you the statistics, before being considered for surgery. And that's multiple factors, um, but I think if your child has been followed by specialists in epilepsy, uh, here in Vancouver that I would very much, I know the epilepsy specialists here, um, value their judgment and opinion as to why surgery wasn't pursued earlier. But um, that's something that I'm going to have to defer further comment beyond to say that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's possible. The other thing I should point out is that sometimes there are honeymoon periods too, right? So honeymoon periods on a new drug can last a couple of years. And then if somebody's been seizure-free for a few years, or the seizures aren't disabling, maybe there's just an aura, or the seizures aren't felt to be causing problems, then maybe surgery gets postponed, or uh, it gets put on the back burner because it doesn't look like surgery is needed right now. But then times can change, either good or bad, and then surgery may get reassessed or readdressed down the road. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes that does happen. Um, and I think that this is where maybe there are complexities to your child's case. For example, one thing I didn't go into at all is sometimes seizures are coming from more than one area of the brain. So if you do a focal resection on one area of the brain, that's not going to stop this area and that area and that area from still having seizures. And that is a big thing that often gets uh, considered when, when we're postponing surgery in somebody who has complex epilepsy. Yeah. 
Yeah. To start with. And uh, you had to follow, or you had to tell them when you were in a particular place. That's right. Now, I don't recall what that test is called. That's called a Goldman visual field test. I didn't mention that because most people don't have that test before epilepsy surgery, but if we think that we're gonna do surgery in an area of the brain where those back parts of the brain for vision may be affected, then we may do that test before the surgery to see if there are any problems with the vision before the operation. For example, if, if somebody had a deficit and they couldn't see very well in their right sort of field and they didn't tell us that this test might pick that up and that tells us oh well we can afford to take that area of the brain out it's not working anyways right that's where we might do that test yeah so i know i had a test and i almost always played the part in scotland yeah Well, the other thing to think about is whenever you're seeing your doctor asking about surgery, if you get put on the wait list to come into the seizure investigation unit, it doesn't mean you're, it doesn't mean you're committing to surgery. It just means you're going to get more information. And then in the end, your doctors will give you the benefits and risks for your case. I've given you group statistics tonight. Yeah. You'll get the risks and benefits for your case, and then your doctors will make a recommendation one way or the other and then you may or may not choose to follow that recommendation. So it depends, but in general, we're looking at about one to two weeks. Yep. Ideally one week, but it can extend up to two weeks. And that's because it takes some time to get the recovery from the surgery the first day. We don't want seizures. And then we slowly but quickly, quickly but slowly, if that makes any sense, try and taper the medicines down so that we can get some seizures, but we don't want too many seizures or big prolonged seizures. And then when we get the seizures, we may need different types of seizures, depending on if you have more than one type of seizure, and we want to see where they're coming from on the brain. And then if everything looks like it makes sense and we've got an answer, then sometimes within the week, the person goes back to the operating room and then that skull comes off, the grid comes off, and then the surgeon does the resection in that same operation, or sometimes we don't think surgery is safe, and then the surgeon just goes and takes the grid off and puts the skull back on and leaves your brain alone. Right. <laughs> no. A lot of the research trials arbitrarily excluded people over age. I think a lot of them excluded people over age 65, but I have seen epilepsy surgery on people who are much older than that. There's no upper age limit. Um, that said, uh, as people get older, um, <laughs> well, as people you know are into their 80s and 90s, People will have strokes as cause for seizures, but then on top of that, there's all kinds of other medical things going on, and we're usually not jumping up and down to do surgery in, in the very elderly, but there's no reason not to consider it in somebody over age 65 if the seizures are disabling and are felt to benefit from the surgery. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's how the seizure can be disabling, of course, right? When when you're not able to 
Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Right. Um, I can't give you a number, but I can see that epilepsy does shorten one's lifespan if it is poorly controlled, medically refractory epilepsy because of the statistics I gave you for SUDEP, but also the risk of injury from the seizures themselves or status epilepticus itself, which is uncontrolled prolonged seizures is associated with a rate of mortality that's not trivial at all. So those things combined do shorten one's lifespan if one has ongoing medically refractory seizures. But I can't give you an average lifespan in a person with epilepsy compared to the general population. I'm not aware of such a number. And I think it would be very dependent on what type of epilepsy and what the seizure frequency was and that uh, individual element that your practitioner would probably be better able to give you. How many different types? Too many. Too many to count? <laughs> Thank you. Okay? All right. I'm sorry I was late.